I now request our chief guest, Mr. Kailash Satyarthi, to deliver the convocation address. Respected Director IIT, Professor Khakhar, Respected Chancellor of Monash University, newly conferred Dr. Anand Mande Mahindra, faculty members, dear young friends, and the parents of some of you who are present here, dear friends from media. I feel humbled and honored to be with you. But I also feel at home whenever and wherever I get opportunity to visit engineering institutes. I feel I am at home because I have gone through five, six years hardships in my own engineering course back in uh, mid-late 70s. I also feel quite privileged to be amongst the brightest brains of our country. You are the future of the country. You are the champions. You are the change makers. You are going to create a new history in technology and corporate, humanity and other disciplines of life. You have acquired the knowledge which one can call the global excellence, the global knowledge. You have much more globalized outlook. But if I may ask whether you have become the global citizen, did you also acquire the value of global citizenship. It's not about this institute. Normally, when the students who complete their professional courses, they always feel that they are in tough competition with the rest of the world. At, and sometimes that competitiveness brings us and our minds very narrow, and we lose that value of global citizenship. We learn here a lot of self-confidence beside other things. You are going back with some sadness that you are leaving your friends whom you lived with, studied with for many, many years. Some of you might be nervous, going to begin a new life, going to accept new challenges. But a great joy in your life. You could recall the day, the very first day of your schooling when you started learning alphabet. First, chota, bada, or A, B. That was the first foundation which was laid down by your first teacher. When your own parents, I know that many of the parents are not so economically well off, but they struggle hard with their own aspirations and dreams to see their daughters and sons as engineers, as scientists, PhD degree holders and so on. This is the time to pay real tribute and thank to all of them. So I would like to congratulate not only the new graduates, but also the parents, if they are listening to me. I could see some faces, but there must be many more. I met a few of them in the hotel where I was staying last night. I found them this morning, and they were so excited, and they have big dreams for their children. Dear friends, 
you have big dreams for yourself. But when I go to some universities and among the students and colleges, and I ask that you may have dreams in five years, ten years, you wanted to become the CEO of a company, you wanted to become an inventor of a new technology, or wanted to run your own business and industry. But many a times when I ask, what do you dream for India in the next ten years? they sometimes fail to answer. Very vague answers sometimes come to me, but there's no concrete thinking what we wanted to see our country in the next 10 years. And even difficult when I ask them that we live in an interconnected world. No problem of the world could be seen and solved in isolation. Right from the global warming and climate change to the problems of terrorism and poverty, the water, then uh, when I ask that what dream you have for the world in next 10 years and what would, you, would be your contribution, most of them fail to answer. And this is a serious question. We have to start thinking for ourselves from now onwards in a different manner, with different self-confidence and resolve. But equally important that let us start dreaming for our country and for the whole world. I'm not a preacher, so I'm not going to preach you here, but I can share some of the the principles or practices I laid down and experimented in my own life. Many people asked, when I gave up the career of electric engineer, and those days we didn't have too many engineers in late 70s. At least in my home state, Madhya Pradesh. But I followed my heart and what I believe that follow your heart and the mind will follow you. As an engineer, I learned to be more strategic, more analytical, more innovative. That knowledge gave me a different kind of courage to analyze and see the problems of the world and try to address them. But the very first day of my own schooling was the beginning of a spark when I saw a cobbler boy outside the school gate. Noticing him like that, working along with his father, but contrary to it, me and all my friends were going to school with a lot of aspirations, new books, new toys new uniform, new shoes. And the boy was looking at me and others. Sitting in my classroom, I asked my teacher the very first question in my life. Sometimes we don't ask questions. We begin our life with answers and end up our life with answers. But as an engineer, the first principle is that we question. As a scientist, we have to question our surroundings and try to find answers instead of having a blind faith on anything. So I asked my teacher that, sir, why he's sitting outside and not with all of us? He said, calm down, it's not uncommon. Poor children work because they're poor. Later on, I asked my headmaster, my friends, my relatives, parents, everybody tried to convince me that they're poor children, they have to work. I could not understand why they are poor. And I was five years old and that boy was also almost of my age. So one day when I was coming back from school, I went straight to his father and asked him, Sir, Babuji, why don't you send your son to school? 
And he was surprised. He said, I have never thought about it. I started working since my childhood. My father, forefathers, did the same. And so is my son. But then, miserably and haplessly, he answered, Babuji, sir, hum log to kaam karne ke liye hi paida hote hain. Babuji, we people are born to work. I refuse to accept that day that some people are born to work at the cost of their freedom, which is most fundamental in our personal and social and global life. I refuse to accept that some children are born to work at the cost of education. And education is another fundamental because we, every one of our, us, are born with two divine rights. One is freedom which God has given to us and that has been endorsed by the systems and constitutions in later stage. But God has made us free. And God has given another divine right and that is right to learn. The day since we born, we start learning. These are birthrights, freedom and education. And even now I refuse to accept that why millions of children are born to do something else than being in education and free. I started looking the world with a different angle, different eye. And when my parents, they were not very rich people. My father was a simple, very ordinary police constable. And my mother was illiterate. But she was after all of the children that every one of us should get good education. Even my sister, those days the women uh, didn't go to school so much, but in a small town, Vidisha, my sister just retired as the principal of a girls' college. So all of us worked like that. So, when I give up the career, which was the great aspirations of my widow mother, she was crying. My all friends said that you become crazy. Giving up the lucrative career and I had no money, but I was there to challenge and change the modern day slavery. And the people who are responsible for were very powerful, notorious mafia kind of people who used to buy and sell the girls especially and boys in lesser price than the animals. And they benefited out of it. I was a big enemy for them. I didn't know how to start after my engineering career. I started with a magazine which was devoted for the for the issues of the child like I saw in my childhood and women especially, the girls who are deprived of everything. One day a desperate father knocked my door of my magazine office. He was lured away along with his wife and many more families from his native village in uh, Aligarh to work at a brick kiln in Punjab. He was desperate because his daughter who was born and grew up in slavery and she was about 15 year old was to be sold to a brothel by the brick kiln owner. That was in 1981, early 1981. They were never, never paid anything. They were never allowed to go back. And all children were born and grew up in a small uh, wired fence area. When I was writing this, I could not believe that India, we love, we respect, we, have, we are so proud of the democracy of my country. How come the slavery still exists? And I started thinking, if, if that girl is my own daughter, or my own sister, what would I do? Instead of writing, I would do something immediately. I will turn down the whole world upside down. 
I decided to go and rescue her. This man, Vasal Khan, told me that, look, Sabo, his daughter's name was, said, we cannot find Sabo like that. You would be killed and I would be killed too. But I again followed my heart. I started thinking something could be done. We hired a truck and we went to rescue a group of those people. Coincidentally, all of them were Muslims uh, from this village in uh, Aligarh. And we were beaten up, as he said, as he apprehended. We were thrown away from the area. I came back empty hands, injuring, injured body, and spoke to some of my lawyer friends in Delhi. We were living in Delhi. One of them suggested that go to the court and file a habeas corpus petition, which I did. Judiciary was always, always sensitive. Much of the success came to us due to the great uh, highest judiciary, that is Supreme Court of India and High Courts, right from then. We successfully rescued 36 children, women and men that day. And I tell you that when I was bringing these young and older boys and girls back from the High Court to my office in uh, Mandi House area, which was not very far from the court, they were jumping like frogs were put into a box and suddenly open the cover and they, they, they jump and run on the streets. And dear young friends, that day, I have realized freedom. I've read about India's freedom struggle. And I was so proud of my heroes, Mahatma Gandhi and Subhash Chandra Bose and Bhagat Singh and Chandshekhar Rajad and Aspagullah Khan and so on. But that day, I felt that I'm not freeing those children, I'm freeing myself. That day I realized that every single child matters. Every single childhood matters. And since then when I see the first smile of freedom on the faces of such children, I see the glimpse of God in them. Whenever I see the first tear rolls down out of joy on the face of a mother who lost all the hope that her child will ever come back and sit on her lap, I see the divinity. I see the glimpse of God on the faces of those mothers. And I am so lucky, I am so fortunate that I have experienced this thousands times, more than 80,000 in my life. I saw God. But it was not enough. The second formula, I would say, I followed my heart and my mind followed me and I made a make good mix of both. But the second thing was that be the most excellent version of yourself. There is always, always a reason to improve. The technology, science has advanced because of there was always a room for improvement and that is also in our life. I did not stop there. I realized that it's a global problem and then I organized a worldwide march in 1998 against child slavery and worst forms of child labor and for education. And that march went on for six months 
crossing 80,000 kilometers distance, which was double than the periphery of the earth. We have not only successful in building a global awareness about this menace, but also with a concrete demand that there should be an international law. Many of you will surprise to listen that until 1998, there was no international convention or law against child slavery, child prostitution, child bonded labor system in the world. There was no UN convention. I started up this march and went on for six months with this demand that at least the, the, the global community, which claims itself so advanced touching the, the Mars and already conquered the moon many years ago, many decades ago, does not have a very simple law so that children are not entering into slavery and prostitution, forced baggery and so on. I got the support from more than, more than 80 presidents and prime ministers, kings and queens, and the same year this international law has been adopted by the United Nations ILO, which you referred. So there is always a room to go bigger and bigger, higher and higher. And even when I got the Nobel Peace Prize, many people thought that Kailashji, congratulations, you have become a celebrity now. The first Indian born Indian to be the Nobel laureate, peace laureate. I said, thank you. And some of the journalists even, this is good to know for you. Some of the journalists from the, the, the Nobel uh, Center told me that Mr. Satyarthi, you are the only Nobel Peace Prize winner who is an engineer. <laughs> if it is true, I think it is true, then it's another reason for me to be with you as a friend, as a brother. But since then, in 1990, Eight, the number of child laborers in the world has fallen from 260 million to 168 million. Almost 100 million children were benefited out of this one thing. But I realized that it is not going to solve the problem until unless we build a big momentum for education, more spending on education, more investment on education. We have seen that the number of out-of-school children have been growing until year 2000. The ODA spending on education was squeezing, falling down. The budgets were also very tiny. And we, today also, only $22 billion are required annually, additional uh, money, to educate every single child on the planet, $22 billion. And these $22 billion are nothing but four and a half day of global military expenditure. And that time, the money which, is, which was required to educate all children in the world was almost just three, three and a half days of annual military expenditure. Very tiny amount. So we build another movement, Global Campaign for Education. And the result was that since year 2000, the number of out-of-school children has been decreased from 130 million to 58 million, less than half. So believe in yourself. When you go for par excellence, when you are improving yourself with big dreams and big aspirations, not for yourself, but for some bigger goal, then nobody can stop you. People thought that I am an ordinary person. I am I'm still an ordinary person. Now, of course, uh, the big people, presidents and prime ministers and UN agencies, heads and secretary general, listen to me and I can talk to them on telephone also. But I feel very ordinary. And I wanted to prove always that 
every common man every common person has tremendous potential inside and if it is properly harnessed channelized we can bring about miracles in the world though my area was not technology or or, or corporate my area was freedom for children and i would able to humbly contribute little bit which i am proud of of course that was possible with a big team good people like minded people etc big support from ordinary people i would all i would also like to share another thing we are taught to be successful and if sometimes we fail it's very frustrating sometimes it is devastating sometimes some young people go and commit suicide they go to another uh, extent because uh, they could not uh, digest failure but what i learned and i practiced was obstacles are best time to explore for opportunities when you are stopped somewhere you can think that how not just go across that obstacle but go much more beyond that one concrete example i was freeing children i was talking to anand ji that i have been using um, <laughs> your getaway and i drove myself most of the time the reason being that i could not trust on drivers they could be influenced they could be you know bribed and so on they can run away so i drive myself so one day i freed a group of children and i was so happy because a boy who lost his father who lost his mother's eyes always crying for him at a very certain a very small age he was uh, lured away from his village i was so happy that was in mirzapur area where the carpet production is rampant most of the carpets are sold outside the world so after freeing him i was and, and many more children i was waiting at the uh, at the railway station in mirzapur for my uh, midnight train and suddenly i saw that dozens of the children were arriving and they were being lured away by two people and instead of uh, uh, taking the train i started arguing with them that you people are bringing these children in uh, slavery trafficking them but they started fighting with me and suddenly though two policemen came it was about 1 o'clock in the morning policemen shook hands with them they said that this guy is creating problems it was in 19 uh, i think 19 uh, 1988 87 or 9 88 so the policemen put me to a small uh, cage like thing uh, the this uh, police post uh, on the railway platform and the whole night i was sitting it was winter night and it was so cold i didn't have enough clothes i was shivering i was angry in the in the beginning but later on i thought that this is not the answer this is a big obstacle because i keep on seeing 10 children and 30 40 50 are joining as bonded laborers that is not the solution so i thought that why can't we go to the corporate sector with a positive mindset and why can't we go to consumers with another positive and constructive mindset the easy thing to copy and follow was to call for a boycott that boycott indian carpet or pakistani or nepalese carpets instead i i started thinking that we have to be positive constructive solution oriented boycott is no answer and corporates are not our enemies some of them are notorious but most of them have heart and soul why don't we go and knock that soul i started talking to them slowly they came they they were convinced that why we should exploit children in the supply chain we have to work for solutions and i launched a campaign in germany and then in america the consumers campaign with a positive and creative answer that consumers should demand a rug which is guaranteed free of child labor child slaves 
that was toughest job but my engineering mind somehow worked well and we were able to evolve the full phased monitoring and labeling mechanism and that is the first social monitoring and labeling mechanism in the history which is taught in many of the uh, the foreign uh, uh, business institutions but that is not important the important is that we have this label which was evolved known as good weave and the result was that since mid 90s the number of child laborers most of them were child slaves in south asian carpet industry india pakistan and nepal was 1 million according to united states department of labor research and that number has fallen down to 200000 because of this positive initiative from 1 million to 200000 and since the export and menu and the production did not go down it it was rather increased it means we were able to find jobs for one for about 800000 able bodied young people and the parents of these children in place of those children that is a vicious circle let me conclude slowly you must understand that when i talk of education we must understand that we live in the age of knowledge economy economy cannot survive sustainability cannot be maintained even the the sustained economic growth of any country cannot be ascertained without advanced knowledge and education there is a bank world bank study recently uh, concluded which proved that it it was done in 50 countries which proved that only basic education the primary education in a country can help in an increase of 0.37% of gdp annual gdp uh if the children are educated and if the secondary education is imparted to the to the people of of a country then this additional gdp growth rate will be 1% more and if 40% of the people according to same study are not well educated not just literate we cannot sustain the economic growth so it is not about the literacy it is about education the proper education so dear friends child labor education and poverty form a vicious circle 168 million children are in full time jobs today and 200 million adults are jobless globally 58 million children have never been to school and 120 million children were dropped out before completing primary education so if you make the aggregation of that and try to bring a parallel we cannot get rid of poverty and unemployment without addressing the problem of illiteracy and child labor and vice versa so dear friends we have been able to demonstrate a little bit now the challenges are bigger you are entering as i said as the leaders in your own fields this is an institute of par excellence and i know that uh, even taking admission in such an institute is not an easy job and those who go out from here must go with unprecedented self confidence and courage with a great sense of leadership because leader are not born outside leaders is inside you why are you looking for the fake heroes here and there the hero is inside you each one of you has a hero inside you you take it out and use it for the betterment of yourself your family your country and the whole world and that's why i you have taken the degrees now 1d and sometimes when i go to uh, universities like yours i say that let us also go back being three dimensional with three more d's beside 1d degree so the first d is dream dream big 
bigger, biggest. But dream, if you dream for yourself and not for your people, not for your friends, not for your country, then you can never be satisfied in your life. You can never live in peace. You can never be the happiest person. You can never enjoy your life if you dream for yourself. Even if your dreams are fulfilled, you can't. Break that narrow shell of your dream for yourself and start dreaming for the whole world. Dream big and dream for better world. That's first D. The second D is discover. Discover the enormous potential of your brain and heart and soul and mind and your body. You are full of strength. And the discover lot of opportunities surrounding you. We are not that country which was known as a poor, miserable, vulnerable country of poor people. We have big leaders, leaders in corporate world. We have big leaders in every sphere of life. And India has all the ingredients. It is in our DNA to become and lead the world on the moral field. Why not we become the moral leader when we talk of Mahatma Buddha and Gandhi and Mahavir and Guru Nanak Dev? We are the land of these good people, so we have all the things in our, our water, in our soil, in our air, and in our DNA that we can prove the moral leader in the world. So you have to keep this element. Wherever you go in the world, keep it. That you come from a country with that great heritage and great values. And discover opportunities from outside. We are a globalized world. So we have to learn and see that what are the global opportunities and be the global leader. And the third D is that do. Dream, discover and do. If you don't act and keep on dreaming, it won't work. If you don't do and discover good things around you, but don't act, then it won't work. So I, I said, dream, discover, and do. All of you can do, all of you can dream, all of you can discover big things, and one day we restore our pride which we had for thousands of years and we can bring enlightenment and prosperity and peace to the whole world. Thank you so much. Thank you once again. Thank you.